Hello, everybody. How you doing? Dave Fenoy here. Another Wednesday, another Ask Dave Fenoy Anything. And uh, really, is it really the 23rd of June? It seemed like we just got to 2021 and now we're halfway through. Happy summer, everybody. Uh, we just had the summer solstice uh, the, on the 21st, uh, the longest day of the year. So it's getting shorter and shorter now. Uh, hope everybody is enjoying. It seems like we're coming out of the pandemic. I know, I know. We have a new variation that uh, is uh, more contagious and whatnot. But, uh, you know, I've got my shots. Hope you got yours and hope those who haven't will get theirs and everything will be hunky-dory before too long. Uh, a reminder, if you're interested in voiceover classes with me, private lessons, DaveFonoy.com, click on the tab that says Study VO. Uh, and these Ask Dave Fenoy Anythings live forever on YouTube at uh, my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy Voiceover Training. Uh, I'm going to bring on a very good friend of mine. Um, he specializes in automotive, and and there he is, Mr. Cliff Zellman. How you doing, Cliff? Yeah, I'm doing great, Dave. It's so uh, oh, wait, you, such you seem to, to have wanted some applause. So <laughs> yeah, there he is. Not to me, buddy. To you. And uh, before we even start, before we even start, I just want to say, and I know that everybody's watching, and I know I speak for many. Uh, you are an absolute treasure. Uh, you are so uh, important to this industry. You give and give and give um, positive, real, credible information with care and Dave Fenoy, man. Oh, I man, mean, just, man. Just, just to be in the same hemisphere with you. Is, okay, is the wonderful. check is in the mail. The check is in the mail. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll donate it. To, I'll donate it to a uh, to a shelter. There you go. To a there dog. you go. Well, listen, um, good to see you, time, man. Yeah, the last time we shared air, I think, was in Normandy, France, wasn't it? It was. It was. Whew. God, it seems it's like so long ago, yet it seems like yesterday at the same time. At which were you we know? doing more? Were we doing more teaching or more eating foie gras? Oh, God, it was 50-50. I think we were learning how to eat foie gras. <laughs> it was crazy. But it was wonderful. If anybody is listening, I'm sure they are, uh, and you ever get a chance, uh, check out the Euro Retreats. JMC just does Oh, it yeah. Right. J. Michael Collins. It, you know, when I first heard about those and he, uh, he mentioned them to me, I went, who's going to pay $7,000 or whatever it was to, to go on this thing? And they're sold out every time. Uh, and it is a wonderful experience, uh, not just for the people who are taking the classes, but for those of us who are teaching the workshops, uh, the amount of camaraderie, the sightseeing, mm -hmm. uh, the food, uh, <laughs> it was fantastic. Mo and I got to spend uh, a, a night in France hanging out with uh, Joe Cipriano and his wife, Anne, uh, then the ride to Normandy. And we're staying yeah, we were in this, on the train. Yeah, we're staying in this chateau uh, that was built in the 16, 1639, I think, was when it was built. It was amazing. You know, you uh, say you want, you know, you can't imagine people paying that much money. It's it's nothing. The experience was fantastic. The experience was fantastic. I can't, I can't understand how he can put it together for that amount of money. Yeah, I mean, it, it's quite literally a dream come true. Yeah, it you know, is. It's it's we can't talk about it, but enough but we'll move on and that well, was the last time that i saw you man we had fun yeah. fun fun well you know a lot of times uh I, I have other voiceover actors on um but i love it when i can get somebody on that is part of our business but not voiceover isn't necessarily the thing that they're known for and uh you cliff are a part of uh acm talent and you are in charge of their automotive department. I don't know of any other uh, uh, voiceover agent that has a motor, uh, an automotive department. How did that come to be? And we'll we'll get to the your origination story. But how did that happen? Well, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, twenty twenty put us a year behind. And I was talking to Mark. You know, and Mark says, you know, hey Cliff, how do you feel about you know not 
stalling a little bit or, you know, that, that we can't launch as quickly as possible. And I basically said to Mark, you know, I feel like a boxer that gets four extra months of training, you know, before I go into the ring, I'm fine. Um, we're going to be launching uh, much more and much more aggressive in the next couple of weeks coming up. Um, I got a call. It's It was kind of fun. I was uh, in a cab or an Uber from McCarran Airport on the way to Wovo mm-hmm. in Vegas. And I looked down at my phone and it's ringing and it's from New York. I figured, okay, somebody from New York is probably somewhat important. So I picked it up and it was Mark and he introduced himself and we talked. And I stood out in front of the Tropicana Hotel for 45 minutes with all my gear because I had workshops and ex, you know, and then sessions to do. And we're talking and talking and we said, and originally he kind of wanted me to, to kind of agent and get voice talent um, for, uh, you know, the roster or, or to get gigs for the roster. Um, that's not really what I do. You know, um, I prepare people for something like ACM or to be independent if they want to go tier three. And we can talk about one, two, and three a little bit later. Um, And we decided, you know, I think that my place with ACM would be with talent development and it's been great. Um, So we get off the phone. This is like a Saturday or Friday. And I returned back to Dallas Sunday. We agreed we're not going to say anything. So I've got this. I just got off the phone call with Mark Gus. Okay, that's that's that alone yeah, is huge, yeah. right? Hang up the phone. I walk into Wobo. Uh, I'm, I'm surrounded by 125 of my best friends, and I can't say a word. <laughs> so for three days, I'm like freaking out, you know, because I, you know, my word is important. I said we're not going to talk about it. So I, for for the three days and, I'm sitting there, and you didn't even have to sign an NDA. No, because we said, let's give it a shot. Yeah, you know, yeah. let's see what happens. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, at, at absolute worst, we walk away pals. Yeah, you know? there you go. Um, and, oh, my God, I you know, I, I don't want to do too much bootlicking, but everybody there is just so wonderful and kind and, and supportive. Not the stereotype of an agent. Not at all. I mean, and I don't really know because I have very little agency background. I was the guy that called the agents. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the, the ladies or, or the, the guys and gals that worked in the finance department or radio vision, they just wrote the checks or did the contracts and the talent would come in. Yeah. So, um, you know, I knew my limitations there. I said, I'm not going to jump in and, and consider myself an agent, which I absolutely do not. Um, but they're all so welcoming and concerned and they care about every single client and it's, and yet, you know this it's, is kind of a, a this is kind of a new thing uh for agents to have somebody on staff that your job is to prepare people for a particular sector of the industry but we'll get back to that okay i want to i want to talk about how you got started you were a recording engineer uh, your dad was a musician, uh, and as I recall from your story, you started rather young. Very young. I was in, I, I think that the key, I don't want to jump in and get all philosophical, but really the key to any kind of success, I think, is to envision it. Mm-hmm. You've got to envision it. You've got to see yourself doing it. I was seven or eight or nine years old, and I saw Ed Sullivan, and I saw a drum set. And there, that drum set on black and white TV was was so captivating to me, and I got so excited that I went to got on my bike and I went over to Baskin Robbins, and I went through the garbage and I pulled out empty ice cream bins, and I made a drum set. Obviously, you couldn't play it, but I just <laughs> kind of built, you know, with my erector set. If there's anybody here that was that remembers Eisenhower being the president would probably remember an erector set. And I put it together and I made a life size model of a drum set out of Baskin Robbins containers. Um, I woke up in the, the next morning and I looked at it and I said, Oh yeah. And I saw a drum set. Um, I would stare at album covers and I would see the old Stratocasters from the early sixties. And, and I would just fall in love with this head. You know, I've got to do this. I've got to own this stuff. 
um, fell in love with the monkeys, you know, and, and <laughs> all that stuff. And I was 11 years old, started a band. Um, what the drummer played uh, soup, wooden soup spoons on uh, different size luggage. And we were doing it. You know, we were terrible. We didn't know any songs, but we were doing it. So I envisioned it. And as the years progressed, by the eight or nine or 10 years old, I took guitar lessons. Before I actually took my first guitar lesson, I uh, went to Baxter Northrop Music on Van Nuys and Ventura, and I bought the Mel Bay guitar chord book, and I studied the, the chords. So when I went in for my first guitar lesson, I already knew a couple dozen chords. I knew how to do bar chords. I knew how to do first, second, third fret chords. I knew a seventh and a minor chord and all that stuff. So we got better and better junior high school, high school, in bands all the time, playing every Friday and Saturday night party up in Encino. And we got a very, very small uh, recording contract from an independent label. And we booked a studio to go in to do a three or four song demo. And this is how I started to be a recording engineer. And this was not with Fidelity Studios in Studio City, which I was chief engineer for 13 years. This is even before that. God, I think it was Hitman Studios or something. If anybody in LA remembers, <laughs> they'll be going, ooh, but hey, that's all we could afford, you know, good enough. The engineer said, I'm going to go across the street and get a Pepsi. Went across the street 10, 15 minutes later, never showed up. We look out the window, there's an ambulance. He had a heart attack. They took him <gasps> to the hospital. He was, he was fine. Oh. But hey, we, we paid for the studio time, right? We didn't have an We're engineer. Gonna, we paid for this time, yeah. We got the time paid for but I knew how to plug a compressor in and out of a guitar. You know, I knew a volume pedal. I knew how the treble knobs. I said, I'm going to try this. And it probably was awful. I don't really remember. But that's really where I got my love uh, and my first start uh, sitting behind a console. Then I received a, a real nice gift from my grandma, Grandma Masha, thank you very much, um, to go to University of Sound Arts. And it was very, very expensive. I mean, there are schools now full sale, which is excellent, but it's very, very expensive. Back then in the late 70s, it was probably about 4,000 bucks, which is a lot of money. And so I went to University of Sound Arts for about a year. And during the towards the end of that, I got a job as, as a second engineer in a studio, graduated that, and I was uh, immediately in a recording studio as the gopher. So I was cleaning <laughs> bathrooms. I was stocking the refrigerator. I was getting, getting stuff for people. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was, I, I tried to, you know, be as, you know, on the level as possible. And then after three or four months, I was uh, promoted to the receptionist. That was a huge <laughs> jump. Did you so have to wear a wig? To, uh, no, this, we were, we were pretty, uh, you know, pretty liberal. A guy. Could I think I just saw Joanne job. sneak in and let the dog in. I think that was my daughter, Anna. Oh, that's Anna. Okay. Yeah, she's she's looking for the dog, which is will never leave my side. Um, and then eventually they let me into the control room and I started to wrap cables and started to clean up in the studio, which was I, I was not allowed. Okay, in quick, the first quick question. Months. Did you learn to wrap cables in that way? That uh, under, over, that, under, over, under, over. Well, there, there's a way, uh, especially for live, that you can wrap them, that you can just throw them out and out they come. You go. Twist over, twist under, twist over, twist under. And then when you throw it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh, yeah. I have wrapped. It's a good thing I like to wrap cables because, you know, if you're an engineer, especially or an assistant engineer, second engineer. That you you're going to wrap a lot of cables. You're going to wrap a lot of cables. Yeah. So um, then I started hanging out in the shop and they taught me how to repair consoles and pull resistors and change light bulbs and pull out the console uh, modules and clean and do all that stuff. Eventually got up to be a second engineer and got an offer a couple of years later to actually be a staff engineer at a studio on Whitsitt and Moore Park, a studio, uh, Fidelity Recording Studios. Infamous studio. Great. There were no rules. The owner said there, you can do whatever you want. The main rule is you got to do your best and you got to be creative. That was. Now, what kind of stuff w were you recording? Mostly music at this point? All music. It was all hair bands. You know, <laughs> basically, yeah, it was, it was all hair bands. Then it started to get into rap, and I did a couple of semi-successful rap albums, and they read the back of the cover, and they see, you know, recorded by Phil Zone Fidelity Studios. So uh, for a couple of years, I was doing rap and hip-hop, which was um, 
I was a little hesitant at first because I was I kind of considered myself an audiophile, and hip hop and rap uses back in the day used kind of scratchy sounding samples and it it wasn't you know pure but there was something there and I got hooked. It on was it. new. It was different. It was yeah. And that that you know what that's the way of the world. That's the way of yeah. the world. Uh, yeah. You hit a certain age and why 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 are these kids doing this? Well, uh-huh. it's their world at that point. Yeah, it's yeah. their Frank creativity. Zappa. Frank Zappa had a great line. Uh, he said, the music business has changed so much be- and that the record people, well, there are no really record people anymore, but not like there were, but they said the record people, the A&R people wanted to get in and, uh, you know, determine what would sell, uh, what is what the kids will like. And Zappa said when he started making records, he would go to the label presidents. they say, I don't know what I'm listening to. Let's just put it out there and see if the kids like it. You know, and that's <laughs> that's what you should do. You know, at, at at my age, you know, I'm not really gonna say what's cool in music or not. To me, close to the edge and you know, selling England by the pound is, is still the greatest music ever. It, you know, Lamb lies down on Broadway. But it's really changed as that that the record people back in the six fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, they just they didn't it wasn't up to them to understand or like the music. Yeah. They still not out there. Still not up to them. Still no, not it's up to them. still not up to them. Still and that's what them. really happened in the 80s and 90s. The A&R, artist and repertoire people, would come in and they would start to dictate what the band was going to do, yeah. what they were going to play, how were they going to look, where they were, you know, the, the images that they were going to have, rather than just letting the band do whatever they want. I mean, could you imagine an A&R guy listening to the very first Alice Cooper album called Pretties for You, which is horrendous, and say, I don't like this, I'm not going to put it out. You know, I mean, it's crazy. You just put it out there and see and what happens. New, and it doesn't well, listen, matter let's, if you like let's, it or not. Let's move on from uh, sure. the long hair music and move into, well, we could say long hair voiceover, or, but just yes. voiceover in general. So now, as a recording engineer, you've moved from music and somehow you end up recording things like uh, Power Rangers, Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? What happened? Little Mouse there? on the Prairie. Well, what happened? Um, the studio started to evolve a little bit, and we're talking about Fidelity Studios. We built Foley pits, and for those that don't know what Foley is, it's human sounds that are reproduced: footsteps, cloth, um, flicking of a of a lighter, you know, switchblade, whatever. Those are added; they're recorded, and. We have pits in the floor that have wood slats and sand and all different textures. So I started to get into recording Foley. And that kind of took me away from rock and roll, which was fine because I was doing it for 25 years. And with the Foley pits came post-production. And with post-production came uh, recording dialogue for animation. So we started, and I was the chief engineer, so which is a curse and a blessing. because It's a blessing uh, because you're always working. Whatever walks through the front door of the studio, if they don't have their own engineer, you get to do it. Uh, It's a curse because whatever walks through the front door, if they don't have an engineer, you have to record it. Um, But I really enjoyed it. And we're bringing in people and they're sitting in a semicircle and the likes of Jim Cummings, Townsend Coleman, Pat, um, I swear, Dave, we did something together back around 95. I don't know if you uh, remember. Well, I, I, I did a lot of work uh, for Saban. I did work Yet. for a couple of other things. I have had some roles on Sonic the Hedgehog. That was um, it with the Jaleel White when during the, the first couple of years? I believe so. That could have been it. Yeah. Because I, I, did, I think I did the first couple seasons of Sonic with Jaleel. Oh, my God, was he fun. I think he came up with the, I'm waiting. I think that was an original <laughs> line. And and Marsha, the uh, director, said, what was that? What was that? And they said, I'm waiting. And I think he's probably talking to me as I'm changing reels or switching out bats or something. <laughs> That's but a hit. I, I fell in love with it. And I got to work with some of the most incredibly talented people. Howie Mandel on Bobby's World. Um, uh, we did Power Rangers was was just a flow of superstars. Um, and I just fell in love with it. And I love ad lib. I love you know just taking it one step further. Um, 
I loved the fact that I, I could sit next to some of the best directors on the planet. Um, and they expect nothing from me just to hit those faders. You know, we've got, you know, you can only have one fader on at a time when someone's talking. You can have, you know, one mic and multiple people talking, but you can't have two mics and one person talking because of the time differential yeah. and yeah. cadence cancellation, all that crap. So I'm sitting there throwing faders, faders up, faders down, you know. And the thing is, is when you're working with people like Jim Cummings and Townsend and, and Pat and, and uh, all these names that I could drop, sorry, it's their ad lib. It's the lines afterwards. So I had to wait until the next person was just about to start and then pull down. God forbid I should pull the fader down on a Howie Mandel. <laughs> because this is really what they're paying for. Well, you, you know, know part, part, part of the, uh, uh, the magic, especially in animation, uh, is one, you, you're not on top of each other. So you got to leave that space. Mm -hmm. And you you as the engineer has to develop a kind of a, a, a second vision, a uh, second hearing of he's not done yet. I know I've got the script in front of me. I see that's where the line ends, but I'm going to wait. And as an actor, uh, when you're in a very uh, creative bunch like that, and this is back in the day when everybody was in the same room at the same time. All, yeah, all, they're all sitting there with four, you know, with the you, 421s on. You know, you, you can't be waiting uh, to, oh, he finished, now I'm going. It's yeah. it's almost like, let me give him a second. Yeah. You know, maybe this yeah. isn't quite over yet. Uh, yeah. Crazy days. Because uh, even now, uh, in a lot of animation, you're not working together anymore. I mean, no. they still get some, but because yeah. we have home studios and we've just had a pandemic... Uh, people are working separately. A uh, number of the cartoons that I've been on over the, the the second half of my career where you were used to going in and we've got a whole ensemble. Well, now you come in and you're just doing your lines and maybe Direct they have line reading yeah, around maybe you. they have the yeah. lines, uh, the reads from the other actors, maybe they don't. Uh, yeah. it's a little different animal now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it was a hotbed of creativity and you know each line on the script had the microphone next to it tweezel was number one grandpa osgood was number three you know and you're sitting there throwing the faders and just before osgood starts to talk i pull his fader up so there's two faders and as soon as osgood starts to talk this guy's down yeah. and if you could go maybe 10 or 15 minutes without missing a fader throw that was great. My hands would drip with sweat. I mean, I was barely 20, 21, 22, making 90 bucks an hour, you know. And if, if <laughs> Which was a lot of money at the time. Oh, my God. Plus, I mean, you remember in the in the early 90s, you'd walk into Deke and there would be the whole, yeah. you know, deli platter. Oh, let me, there, let me give it this. Deke. Deke. <laughs> yeah, Andy Hayward was a very nice guy. Did you ever get to meet Andy? I'm not sure I did. Owner of uh, owner of Deke, yeah. He was, oh uh, no, he was I did get to meet Andy, but I, I didn't yeah. know his last name. I, I worked Hayward, with the, yeah. with uh, the directors. Uh, Simone uh, worked with Simone. Uh, God, what a nice guy! When I told him I was moving to Dallas, he said, "Cliff, you are out of your mind." I said, "Why is that?" He says, "I got fifty people outside the door that will do what you're doing right now for free." <laughs> yeah, he was, but not he was for long. They, they'd want to get paid eventually. <laughs> eventually, it's like you know what. I got a car payment due. Okay, it was, so it was fun. So, so you're a guy that's uh, an engineer. You've done music. Now you're doing animation, and somewhere along the way, you become the car guy. How did that happen? I moved to Dallas. <laughs> you would and you would think it would be Detroit. <laughs> it, well, oh God, no, no, no. Um, I moved to Dallas because of the '94 earthquake. Um, my house south of the of Ventura Boulevard was the black dot on the map. Um, uh, it was completely destroyed. You don't really have earthquake insurance in LA because it's like 80 grand a year unless you're like Best Buy, you know. Um, my brother moved to Dallas a couple of years beforehand and we came and visit him. My wife and I would come and visit three, four times a year. I love my brother. And we're walking down the street, walking his dog 10, 11 o'clock at night and we see a house for sale. 
and in Dallas they have a like a post with and you can pull it out and it's a sheet and it tells you all about it the taxes the the foundation the schools all that stuff and I looked at the price I looked at a number and remember we're looking for a house in LA in the valley and I looked at it, I said wow honey this looks like a, a very reasonable down payment and my wife says that's the price of that house <laughs> and we're like oh my god could we live here yeah we could live here so uh, we moved to Dallas within a month of being here. I got a call to go to Taipei to open a new studio and teach their engineers. I, this is probably like my fourth, fifth, or sixth trip already. And I left my wife and two-year-old daughter in a city with nobody but my brother for a month. And when I came back, I hooked up with a company called Radio Vision. And I had an interview. And the, the same in the morning, I had an interview with a company called the Stokes Group. And they are a production company. And it's, it's all nationals. I went in for the interview. They've got United Healthcare in one room, American Airlines in another room, Nathan's Hot Dogs in another room. And I'm, wow, very cool. Everybody's, all the engineers are walking around with great, you know, beige dockers, white shirts, and a name. <laughs> I said, okay. You know, I came from Fidelity Studios, which was infamous. The bad boy studio. So I said, okay, this is cool. You know, I can deal with this. I'm a mature adult. Then I went for the interview in Radio Vision. Please don't get mad at me, Radio Vision. I walked in. The place was a friggin' disaster. They were using a half-inch 16-track. It was just a, a with a TIAC board and an old AT microphone. And, and I walked in and I said, I can make a difference here. I'm not going to make any difference at Stoke Group. I'm just going to clock in and clock out and sit and push my faders and go home. But Radio Vision, I said, okay, you know, I can... I can, I can help here. them. I can help them. We brought I brought them into the digital age. There was another engineer there that was kind of familiar with Pro Tools. Um, and uh, so we set up, we did everything, and it was great. And Radio Vision specialized in Tier 3 automotive. Well, I love cars, and I grew up in the Valley. So, you know, be there Sunday, Irwindale Raceway this Sunday. So, you know, I grew up with that stuff. And I, I, it brought together engineering, directing, writing, mixing, mastering, getting music, editing music, keeping clients. It was everything that I wanted to do that wasn't rock and roll, bass over dubs at four o'clock in the morning. You know, it was not uncommon. You, in you'd have regular in. hours and doing something that you like doing. I got the weekends off. <laughs> when I was at Fidelity, I, I, I never saw my wife. I missed every party. I missed every bar mitzvah. I missed every wedding, you know, because I was working. Because you were working. Listen, she'd go you on vacation with her friends. You mentioned uh, tier three. Yes. What are the tier three, tier one, tier two, tier three? What are those? In in automotive, automotive advertising is broken down into three tiers. Tier one is national, and that is Ford F one fifty Taurus Taurus. <laughs> That's how old I am. Sorry, um, you know whatever. Um, it is the national advertising that is automotive centric that speaks specifically of the automotive, the fine lines of the artist, this car, blah, blah. Yes, you and your car, blah, blah, blah. You finally arrived. And then three quarters into the spot and right now get $2,000, $3,000 off during national blah, 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 blah. Ford, built Ford proud, end of spot. It is a national spot that plays all across the country. That's tier one. Tier two is a regional spot that plays within a specific airspace, for example, the um, Twin Cities Honda Group. And what that is, is that's a national spot with a five or 10 second tag. We've all seen that. It's a national spot that cuts to black with the logo uh, test drive today at Cliffy Chevrolet in the heart of Dallas or test drive today at your area Toyota dealer. So that's a group where we're still automotive specific but we are talking about a specific group of dealerships within a region. So that's regional. Um, automotive uh, dealerships purchase the cars that are on their lot. It's not like Ford drops off, you know, $10 million worth of inventory and says, good luck. Uh, the dealerships actually buy those. And because the dealership says, hey, Ford, I just spent, you know, $20 million. Help me advertise. They'll help you advertise. That's called co-op. So the manufacturers will give the dealerships X amount of dollars, depending upon certain scales and so on and so on. How many cars they're selling and so forth. Yeah. How many people they have, the re you know, the area that they're in with the reach, you know, there, there's like baseball, there's a stat for everything. So that's 
tier two regional now of an independent voice actor doing automotive that does regional pretty much all they're going to do is the tags and there's nothing wrong with that you get a stack of tags a day you read them all day test drive in lubbock test drive here test drive here test drive all over the country that's tier two tier three is a single owner dealership cliffy chevrolet in Dallas, I may have a used lot. I may have a, or a pre-owned. We don't say used. A pre-owned lot. We may have a, a Chevy lot, a Ford, whatever. But these are advertisements that are for a dealership specific, one dealership. And the main difference in the advertising uh, strategies, tier one is all about the car. Tier two is all about the area. And tier three is all about the dealership. So when we do a tier three spot, we're talking about service sales selection after the service or after the sale um meet our people come in and meet bob spin the wheel to win try you know ride the camel come out for barbecue oh, we and have by these the way, used cars for sale and uh and yeah, we're and gonna by say the way, we we're gonna say we're gonna say the vin numbers the numbers really really fast <laughs> we have to in some states in some states you can say See store for details. Yeah. In Texas, it's like Texas is nothing. You know, it's like see our you know, website for details. It, it's um, I've been a, a Lexus voice for about oh, twenty years now, mm -hmm. um, and not the tier one. Love to be the tier one, uh, mm -hmm. but definitely tier two. I'm all over the country on uh, uh, ethnic buys, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes I get to do it in my regular voice and sometimes they have sped me up uh but i find Time no matter permission. how fast they make my voice the money spins not more the same. than eight or not more than eight or nine percent you know time compression is does, done on a ratio so it's one to one is normal time one to point nine point eight yeah. point seven um if you're at you know point seven zero zero you're you're speeding it up 33 percent that's yeah. a lot there, there's you know. something about voiceover when you're the voice you don't hear yourself a lot but everybody else does mm -hmm. i i talk to my daughter every week or so and in new york and uh she's like, oh dad i was just you know a lot of times i'll get a call oh dad i was driving around and i was hearing you you know every five minutes and i'm like well Great. I'm not here. Glad to know it's playing. It's uh, but there, if you but got there, the check, it's probably But you're playing. talking really, really fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the reason being, and it's not that we're trying to get anything over on you. We just got a lot of information. Yeah. You know, and sometimes the state requires you to put in so much of the disclaimer. And, you know, uh, individual dealerships, you know, although they've got plenty of money, <clears throat> they don't have the budgets that the nationals do. So they'll try to do two or three cars. Yeah. You know, they'll say F-150, 34, 599, Focus, 26, 499, yeah. Fusion, blah, blah, blah. So we try to get all those. And with each one of those cars, especially if it's a pre-owned car, that's when the disclaimer is huge. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, if there's uh, any kind of incentive or terms, specialty terms, no payments for 90 days, 0% uh, for the life of the car, that's got to be in the disclaimer. And um, we've all heard, you know, it's all over Sunday. It's all over Sunday, and it actually is all over Sunday because those terms are coming from the manufacturer. They're not coming from the dealership. If you want 0% financing for the life of the loan, but it ends on July 31st. Better get in there before July 31st. Because it's it's if you finance through Ford Motor Corporation, yeah. if you finance through Toyota Acceptance Corporation. You okay. Know, so, now so when those deals expire, the dealership, unless they want to do it themselves, you know, uh, they're not available. You'll get a bedliner. You'll get whatever. You know, there's something else yeah. always. Well, but, this is uh, this is great information you're giving now for the person going in to buy a car. And I know a lot of people here are hopefully going to go in and buy some cars here. But I think what people are most interested in, how can they become a part of this huge industry as a voice actor? Uh what are the kind of voices you're looking for? What are the skills uh, of a voice actor that's going to do stuff in the automotive industry? What are the expectations? One of the things you, you mentioned on that tier three guy who is reading tag after tag after tag after tag. That's tier two. That's uh, tier oh, two. that's tier two. Sorry. Uh, tier two guy um, or gal. Uh, what's that life like? How do you get into it? What do you do to help people become a part of the automotive industry in advertising? 
Tier one, you must be union. You must have massive representation. You're not going to get a national Ford spot on your own. You say, well, what about Matthew McConaughey? <laughs> Matthew McConaughey's got massive representation. Matthew He's McConaughey's Matthew Lloyd. McConaughey. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, Kiefer Sutherland is Kiefer Sutherland. And, and, and Dennis uh, Leary is Dennis Leary. And all these guys, they've got all their ducks in a row. So if, if you don't have national representation, don't even think about getting into tier one. It's not important. It's not for you. Um, if you do a national spot for Ford, you can't do anything else. You okay. sign a non-compete and that's it. And sometimes those non-compete can last a year or two after the contract expires. So I would say to the bulk, uh, to the majority of the people that are watching this, what you really want to do is focus on tier three. Tier three, you are your own person. You could live in Kansas. You can live in Iowa. You can live anywhere in the country. And you are soliciting your demos, your work, your website, your experience to automotive advertising agencies. You get on a roster of an automotive advertising agency is like getting on the roster of a talent agent. Um, they have a casting department. And you, they will take your voice or your demo to the dealership and say, what do you think about this guy? I love this guy. This guy sounds like my dad. Uh, we need somebody <laughs> stronger. We need somebody more sincere. But tier three, and I've said this for 25 years, to me, tier three is the holy grail of voiceover, um, of jobs for voiceover talent because it's nonstop. Everything you do this week, you got to redo it again next week because terms change incentives change models change there's 15 16 17 different automotive manufacturers across the world every one of them advertises every one of them changes every one of them has five or six different models ford doesn't only advertise the f-150 they, they do all their models so you get into one dealership you're doing every model within that dealership and you're doing it every 10 days because incentives change. It is very, very bad news to run a commercial with expired offers. You can get Ooh. a lot of trouble, a oh. lot of trouble. Um, I could either pay a huge amount of money for every airing on every radio station as the production company, or I can get down on my hands and knees and beg the dealership to just give it to them, you know. You know, and, uh, wait a minute, I've got a little note here that mentions you, Beatrice Ryan. Uh, had audition directions today to read Disclaimer Fast Financial Company. Uh, mm -hmm. Use Cliff's method, read clearly, and speed it up in post for that section. Don't know if I got the gig, but I like that part. Uh, and that happens a lot now. Um, so if somebody does have to read something uh, faster than they actually would probably say it, your technique is to? My technique is to read it not as fast as you hear it and keep it relatively monotone. Some restrictions apply. See store for details, tier one and tier two, three credits or only. Yeah. And then when you compress it, all of those inflections become accentuated. So you keep it kind of on the down low. Kind of flat. Kind of flat. And then when you compress it, you are crystal clear. Um, it doesn't, uh, the enunciation is, is wonderful. And I'm only talking, you know, 10%, not a whole lot. Yeah. 10%, 10% is a lot in just regular dialogue, but for a disclaimer, we're used to hearing all kinds of digital, uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, with insurance companies, good Lord, you know, um, they, they do 50%. Um, but to do it, you know, somewhat much slower than you're used to hearing. Um, and then allow time compression to keep your read crystal clear. And again, keep those, keep the inflections moderate because when you do time compress, they're a little bit more exaggerated. Yeah. Now, so anybody out there, you know, go to any, any automotive uh, website, go to Chevy and just, you know, look for a disclaimer and, and try it, you know? Oh yeah. There, read it. You can get the copy. Now, one of the things you mentioned uh, was automotive casting agency. Now, Automotive ad agency. At, oh, at, okay. And within the ad agency, they have their casting department. Okay, when you say automotive and, ad, would that be your typical ad agencies and one department of it, or? Yes. 
Yes, it oh, would be okay. your typical ad agency that specializes in automotive. Okay, and just a Google search? Yes, um, but don't Google search, you know, automotive advertising agencies. This is this is a little special thing for all the people watching Ask Dave Anything. When you go to Google, type in 10 best automotive advertising agencies in San Diego, 10 best automotive advertising agencies in Los Angeles, Sacramento, and then just go through the entire country. If you're very specific about the region in your Google search, that's what you're going to get back. If you type in automotive advertising agencies in Google and just leave it at that, whoever owns SEO is going to be the whole front page, service, personnel, you know, about us, you know, all that stuff. And you're going through page after page after page, you get it coming up with two or three names. What you want to do is you want to get a list. And the best way to get a list is to be specific about the area that you're searching. If you write in 10 best automotive advertising agencies in Dallas, Texas, you know, uh, be specific about the city. Then you start to build a list. These are the people that you want to, uh, you know, send your demos to. And when you send your demo, uh, be very, 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 very brief, very brief. And you guys, have, if anybody's seen me talk before, um, something like, and please don't use this because I've, you know, I've told a thousand people. Greetings, Dave. I'm a professional voice actor specializing in automotive. I deliver broadcast quality audio. Now, broadcast quality audio, there's a debate whether or not we want to use that term. But to the outside world, it's specific and we know what they mean. We don't have to get too specific. Yeah. I deliver broadcast quality audio in two to four hours. Here's my demo attached. Thank you for your consideration. That's it. I don't want to hear who you trained with. I don't want to hear what you got in your studio. I don't care if you like dogs or cats. I don't want to know anything about you <laughs> until... I hear your demo. Yeah. I don't want to make any comments. I don't want to, I don't want to critique if somebody sends me, Hey Cliff, you know, I'd love for you to listen to my demo. I don't really do that, you know? Um, and, or, uh, I've also heard, you know, people saying, Hey, I, I'll only send my demo if I have permission to send the demo. Well, somebody says, Hey Cliff, uh, do I have your permission to send your demo? Well, now I have a relationship. Now I've got an assignment, you know? I would much rather get in my email, automotive demo, open it up. Whoa, Cliff, it might be a virus. It ain't going to be a virus. You know, you yeah. can tell. Viruses come from Amazon, you know, or you have a delivery. It's you, know, you just spent $500. Click here to cancel. Yeah. Oh, I better click here. That wasn't how, how fast do you know whether the person sending that demo is good enough to do the automotive work or not? A cliche within five, six seconds. Yeah. 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 It, you know, it's, it's, do they grab my attention? Are they compelling? Um, do they know the flow of an automotive spot? Do they understand how to read the call to action? Do they understand the uh, creation of urgency, point of sale, um, the difference between terms and incentives, uh, how to read uh, the closer, how to do an opening, how to switch from character to the retail part of the read? Oh, um, oh, automotive it, has to be compelling. You give us keep me there. Yeah, just those things you mentioned. Give us just a a short version of each of them, of of what you mean by that, by those terms. All right. Well, hold on here. Let me pull something up real quick. Stand by. All right. So, for example, there are fifteen that I've written specific points within an automotive. Um, spot and this is valuable stuff um not all 15 are within one spot but every line within an automotive spot is one of these 15 so establishing shot number one here in colorado you know when you see a movie you see the golden gate bridge you know yeah. in california yeah. you see so the establishing shot i'm a mom I had no idea I was going to be driving 15 kids. So that's the establishing shot. Then the character establishment, I'm a full-time dad. So here in Colorado, I'm a farmer. I know it's basic, but I'm, I just use yeah, it. No, I got you. I got you. I understand. So I'm a full-time dad. I work hard. I'm a soccer mom. Or even lost in thought. The road ahead seems like an endless... Okay. So then there's the manufacturer. We talk about the manufacturer, who they are, Ford. If it's local, Cliffy Ford. If it's national, Ford. Then the name of the event. There's always an event. President's Day, end of close, uh, year end, close out, spring into summer. Then we move on to creation of urgency. 
for a limited time now through Labor Day. Our inventory is moving fast. Come, you know, hurry in while the selection is still good. Then there's the vehicle model. Then there's the incentive. Now, an incentive and terms are somewhat different sometimes. When people think of an incentive, they think of $500 off, $5,000 off. Yeah, that's an incentive to buy a car, but that's not really what we do in advertising. An incentive is anything that's going to make you feel better about yourself. Something that's going to make you, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a man. or I'm or, smart boy, I'm for a, doing this. Yeah. Or, or I'm rugged out. for doing this. I'm driving down the road and everybody's looking at me with the flames on the side of the truck and my cool bed liner and my fog lights on top. So an incentive is, is, and it's usually a laundry list, something like power steering, dual climate control, six passenger airbag, uh, bed liner, largest payload, a reason to buy it other than the price. Then we have the discount, get $5,000 off MSRP. Then we have the price point, how much is the actual vehicle? Then the terms. Terms are simply how much and how long. How much do you owe? How long do you have to pay it? Most people, when they buy the car, they didn't even know what the total price is. They just know that's on $326 a month for, or $326 yeah. bucks a month for a thousand bucks you know, down and thousand bucks a month. Yeah, for, for four <laughs> years, five years, six years, God forbid, seven years. Um, so terms would be 0% financing, no payments for 90 days, 99 down and 99 a month. Um, then we move on to make your life easy. And that's the one that I just added to this because of COVID. You know, we're we, here at Cliffy Chevrolet. We make your life easy. Delivered to your home or office, a virtual test drive. Then there's the call to action. Call to action is anytime I'm asking you to do something. Get off the sofa, pick up the phone, check out, go to our website, come in this weekend. Test drive today. You know, that's the call to action. Then we have our location, contact point, the address, uh, phone number. We don't usually say on the radio unless it's 1-800-NEW-CAR or something like that. Something easy to remember. Uh, <laughs> web URL, nearest cross streets if it's a local. Motto is in there. Um, and then the disclaimer. Everything I said is a lie, which is not true. <laughs> but So those are, those are briefly... Establishing shot, character establishment, manufacturer, name of event, creation of urgency, vehicle model, incentives, discount, price point terms, make your life easy, call to action, location, motto, and disclaimer. Those are the 15 solid points of an automotive read. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read you each one. And I'm just going to, every time I do this, I'm going to move to another point, okay? And this script is relatively lame, but I use it because it's easy to relate to and easy to understand. So, establishing shot. Ranch life isn't easy. Character establishment. You work the land from sunrise to sunset. You need a truck that works as hard as you do. Manufacture. Well, here's some good news. Jefferson Ford is going to make it a little easier for you. Name of event. With the spring into summer sales event. Creation of urgency. For a very limited time. Vehicle model. Own a fully redesigned Ford F-150 Super Crew. Incentive with power steering, dual climate control, six passenger airbag, free bed liner, and the largest payload in its class. Discount and right now get five thousand off MSRP. Price point that's only twenty one nine ninety seven. Terms plus get zero percent financing for sixty months, no payments for ninety days. We make your life easy. We'll even deliver your F one fifty to your home or office. Call to action: Come in for a test drive and your chance to win a sixty inch flat screen TV. Location, exit 193 off the 101 or visit jeffersonford.com. Motto, Ford, built Ford proud. Disclaimer, some restrictions apply with approved credit. Not all buyers will qualify. See dealer for lease and purchase details. So those are all <laughs> 15 points. And it sounded like a car spot, except for me interjecting what they were. Um, knowing how to read multiple prices is important. Um, so when I hear a demo and I hear all of those in a demo read properly, I know this guy knows how, or gal knows how to do automotive. And about 10 years ago, maybe even more, I attended FAFCON 2. That's how long ago that was. We haven't had a FAFCON in three or four years. And the last one was nine. Um, I stood up in front of a whole bunch of people and I said, you guys don't know who I am, but I'm going to work my butt off to get more and more women into automotive. I'm tired of being yelled at. Women are empowered. Women are running the world. I think women are far superior to men in every aspect, except for physical strength. Um, well, so they sure can't play wife, battleship. I know your wife would agree to that they, one. They can't play battleship the way we do. No, because we <laughs> slam things down and throw the board. Oh, you, you missed the whole toilet joke. Oh, that kind of battleship. Yeah, oh, okay. I you thought know. you were the real battle. You mean, uh, to me, it's the Cheerios game. 
But oh, I, ra- okay. I, I raised daughters, so what, what do I know about that? Stuff? <laughs> oh, this kind of battleship. <laughs> oh, never mind. Mu- never mind. It was, it was a joke that just we'll didn't land. So women are, you know, they they shouldn't be. Well, you know what, little lady, why don't you bring your husband in? And we can cut a deal. That does that stuff doesn't go on anymore. You know, so thankfully, more and more women. And I'm sure you you know, Dave, you've heard almost fifty percent of of automotive now is is women. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and it's great. I love it. I love working with. Uh, they're so good. Um, half of the demos that I'm doing now are for women. Um, and, uh, they were like, yeah, sure. And I said, well, you know, trust me, I'm going to work. I'm going to fight every time one of my clients wants a new voice. I'm going to suggest a woman and the talent that's available out there that really understand automotive are huge. But, you know, back to the question, how long does it take? If I can recognize that they know how to handle each one of these, I could send one script to 10 different people all very highly qualified, very talented voice actors. But if they've never read automotive, it's not going to happen. So the neat thing about automotive is the competition is a little bit less. It's getting more and more every day as more and more voice talents are saying, hey, you know, I can live anywhere in the country and still work, you know, do multiple spots a day with dealerships all over the country. Radio Vision had clients from Walla Walla down to, you know, Vero Beach, Florida. And you know, it's, every, I, uh, every stop in between. I was at uh, a, a VO Atlanta a few years ago, and a young man uh, had a conversation with me, and he was complaining that, well, you know, I'm doing a lot of automotive, I'm, doing, I'm working every day, to, and he's making really good money. And he said, but I want to get out of it. And I looked at him and said, well, why? Uh, and basically he just wants to, ex- he wanted to expand what he was doing, uh, which I think is fine, but you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Oh gosh. Now, in fact, I hear a lot of the opposite, you know, I'm doing audio books, which I, to me, audio book, I mean, you guys, are, those guys are the heroes of the voiceover business. I don't know how the hell they do it. Um, <laughs> I do, I mean, but I don't want to so- do it. I, I've is, done three. Is- I hope to never do a fourth. <laughs> there is more responsibility in an audiobook voiceover than any other genre. I mean, you know, with just with the guidelines of recording, let alone not missing one word. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Um, but I hear a lot of people doing, you know, explainer videos and doing, you know, audiobooks that, that say me, I want to expand into automotive. Yeah. So um people didn't really consider doing voice talent, didn't really consider doing automotive. They considered doing Commercials, animation, Nat Geo narration, yeah, and audiobooks. You know, maybe an explainer video if you worked with a corporate company. You you know, and you worked for the company. You work for Siemens or whatever, and you would do their. You know, you'd be the voice of their in-house training stuff. But an independent voice actor never really thought about getting. I would say in general, never really thought about getting into automotive, mainly because a lot of people think it's all screaming and yelling. That you know, brings up my next question, which was be was was going to be that is kind of the stereotype of it. Um, how wide is the range of read and voices in automotive these days? It's anything. The only thing they have in common across the board is four tires and a steering wheel. You could have something like every stop sign and every red light is just a reminder that you're not quite where you want to be until today in the all new Mercedes C-Class. Or when the tents go up, the prices go down. Two giant automotive <laughs> dealerships together for one weekend to bring you the best prices. And that. So it's anything. It could be a midline read. It could be a 25 year old girl with beige pants and a red shirt with a name tag walking through a Toyota dealership talking about sign and drive. Um, it could be some kind of hit guy that's pretending he's the owner of the dealership. Hey, everybody, this is Jim with Cliffy Chevrolet, and we're here to talk about, and it's an on-the-lot spot. So it's anything. It's luxury. It's country. It's, I just got out of college, and that tells you two things. I'm really smart, and I'm really broke. So when I heard about the new Kia, blah, 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 blah. You have been looking at a lot of these scripts. (laughs) I have done over 22,000 car spots. I figured it out. Since 1995, September 1st, 1995, I've produced over 22,000 car spots. 
And what has that Crazy. done to your psyche? Would you like to sit love back it. and love talk it? Love it. I'm the happiest it. guy you'd ever want to meet, man. <laughs> I love it because they're so different. You know, doing records, it's a legacy. You know, I would sit and listen to the the, the nylon tip of the hi hat for four hours to get that perfect, you know, perfect. Now I go to my music library. I mean, I'm still very, you know, yeah. uh, conscientious of what I'm doing, but. I do it. It's done. I do it. It's done. I don't work on the same song for four or five days. Yeah. You know, and I don't work for 18 hours straight and I'm not at the mercy of the bass player's girlfriend or the A&R guy or the lawyer or this guy and that guy. And, you know, and everybody in the band, you know, the band, we used to have a joke called band overboard, which is when everybody in the member of the band has their fingers on their own faders, guitar players shoving up his lines, the drummer shoving up, you know, his his faders the bass player can't hear so he's shoving up his and i i got tired of it 20 years of rock and roll was great i don't want to do it you, anymore you grew but, out of it well yes and no <laughs> you know i still have all my all my guitars over there oh yeah you know yeah, i got a to... bunch of them by, back here over behind me <laughs> got to got to have your guitars um hey got I love... got a note hit from uh, uh Dennis Kleiman. um just did my automotive demo with Cliff, and I am thrilled with it, notwithstanding how great it was to work with together. Oh, the feeling is and, mutual, man. And if you don't know Dennis, Dennis is English and South African. He has that that mm. that wonderful English accent. He, uh, and, but forget all that. Forget all that. He is the classiest, yes. coolest guy you would ever want to meet. Yeah, he's I a great remember guy. talking to, to a, a mutual friend of ours. And I was talking to her and I said, hey, I just got off a Zoom uh, session with Dennis. Let me ask you, is he is he as classy as I think he is? I mean, is this guy as impressive as I think? She goes, absolutely. He's a great guy. And thank you, Dennis, for the kind words. It was it was an honor to, to work with him. Well, you've, you've had a few more that I, I haven't put up. Um, I had one. This is kind of a, a little bit long question, but... Uh, uh, Theo Mezzacapo, question for Dave and Cliff. With animation and video games, you're playing a fully fleshed out character. You can dirty up the read, putting yourself in different headspace. With commercials, you're still essentially playing a character, but one that's relying, uh, that's relaying information. How do you achieve that without the ability to dirty up the read? And is it, uh, sometimes more difficult? I think that automotive is one of the hardest genres of voiceover. Um, because you have to really make it something that is recognizable and something that uh, we've heard before. Uh, a lot of dealerships are very superstitious. Uh, they want to keep a uh, great thing about local is if you get become the voice of a dealership, you're probably going to be the voice of the dealership for the next 10 years, unless they sell it or they get a new general manager and he wants to hire his brother-in-law to come in and do the spots. Um, here's here's the, a good answer to your question. You assume the personality of tier one. You assume the personality of the car. You look at a Kia Soul. What would a Kia Soul sound like? What, what conversation would you have with an $18,000 car? You look at a Cadillac, XTS. You look at a Jaguar. You look at a BMW. Each one of these cars has a personality. You become that personality. That's the artist in you as a voice talent and an artist to be able to do that. When it comes to tier three, you become the personality of the dealership. So whatever that persona of the dealership is, you become that. If it's a fast talking dealership, you're a fast talker. If it's in Texas or Louisiana or anywhere like that, you're starting to talk like this. You know, you're, if you're a Ford dealership, if you're a, a truck, you know, you're doing trucks, you kind of be, you know, a little bit kind of manly. Or if you're a woman, you know, you're a strong independent woman talking about whatever, you know, truck or... Well, I'll uh, tell you, if, if you're the guy who asked the question, Theo Mezzacapo, you're going to be in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so you you take on the, the personality of the dealership. So when you say dirty up the read, well, you're not, it's not about the voice talent. Never make your read bigger than the words on the paper. Okay, you were a conduit to give, to, to relay the message in a credible compelling and agreeable way not to search for the word you know not not to try to make your performance really strong it, that's not your job your job is to relay the message 
with the personality of whoever handed you that script. If it's Sewell Lexus in Dallas, they're a very classy dealership. You take on the personality of Sewell Lexus. If you're a screamer, you know, Big Daddy's used cars, then you become Big Daddy. So your personality is is pre-written into that script. I hope that answers your question. And um, there's I, you not know a what? whole and lot of ad-libs. I, I was going to say, that very much is what you are when you're a spokesperson for something. If you're a McDonald's, exactly. it's the feeling yeah. of that particular McDonald's spot. Um, if you're talking about uh, high-end luxury, this, that, or other, that's what you are. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you're talking about uh, different kinds of cars, different kinds of personalities to go with those cars and or uh, dealerships. Dealership. Yeah. Exactly correct. That's exactly it. If that's that's a great takeaway from from this conversation. Yeah. Assume the personality. You know, when you're doing animation, you can augment that character, and they want you to do that because in most cases in animation, the voices are recorded first. And then they're animated, too, because there's a big difference between, hey, everybody, or hey, everybody, and that read is going to spark the animator how how wide the eyes are, how big the grin is, is going to match the dialogue. Okay, there's so, a, there's a, I, I know this is important information, but this is probably the most important question uh, I've seen today. How do you pronounce Jaguar? Jaguar. Jaguar. And uh, let's you know. <laughs> not yeah thank you Dennis. not jaguar now we were all raised in the valley to say jaguar um some local dealerships may have a one you know an old you know j or whatever uh you know in, in their uh inventory so, they so. may say jaguar but if you are going if you are a jaguar dealer you're gonna say jaguar 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 Al aluminium yeah, well, that's so English. Aluminium. Yes, quite, quite. Yeah. Well, listen, that wraps up an hour. It went by so fast. What the hell happened? Uh, well, time. Time flies. My dog he... didn't even wake up once. Yeah, there you go. Listen. Let's do this again. Oh, Cliff, absolutely, absolutely. And I just want to thank you, one, for just being you. Uh, Back you're one you. of the kindest and most helpful people I know in this business. Uh, well, you. you show thank up. You and uh, you, 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 really, you really do help people. And this has been a huge amount of information uh, along with your history. And mm -hmm. one of the best things about doing this is people I've known for years that, you know, as friends, you don't really add, well, how did you get started in this business and so forth and yeah. so on. Uh, you, you're just friends and you're talking about what's going on right now. But it's great to hear your story. Yeah. Uh, that's Nobody one knows I made a drum set out of Baskin Robbins ice cream containers when I was eight years old. Yeah, that's. that's I kinda... also took a wood contact paper and put it around it to make it look like. Wood. <laughs> and you just happened to have wood contact paper lying around I the house. I mad my mom <laughs> go out and buy me. Well, you know she's she's not. Gonna, I mean, if your kid was building a, a, a drum set and wanted you to go to, you would do it in a heartbeat. Of well, you know you what? Would. Well, uh, fortunately, my kids are grown now, but. Um, <laughs> I would. Of course and you would. one of the best Anything things one of the creativity. best things about my parents is whatever it was I was interested in, they did everything they could to see that I got the tools and materials I needed to involve myself in it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I I tell parents that all the time. Doesn't matter what your kids into, you don't have to be into it. Mm -hmm. Uh but you They're don't probably know, best you're not. Yeah, but you don't know where it's going to take them. <laughs> Uh, I, I think about all, all the friends of mine who were the, the cut-ups in class. I was one of them, too, uh, mm -hmm. making crazy voices and this, that, and the no other. Doubt. And, you know, that the teachers were going nuts and sending notes home. That you know, Johnny's not paying attention in school or he's making funny sounds. And, uh, and how many of those people have great careers in this business now? So oh, yeah. if, you, if your kid you, you is doing Pat it and likes Fraley doing was it. A, was, you think Pat was an easy student? Oh, no. I don't no, think so. No, no. I don't. No, you think you think Howie Mandel was an easy to have no. in fifth grade? No, 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 no. And wouldn't but shake you know, anybody's hand. The fist bump. <laughs> the fist bump. Um, but uh, yeah, man, boy, this went by too fast. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'm that easy was my to get next in touch question. With. How do you get um, in touch with Cliff Zellman? 
Well, my 24-7 email address is czelman10 at gmail. And I love to talk to people about automotive. I love to send you a script, have you read something. I'll critique it. Um, no charge. You know, let's see if this is going to work for you. Um, I'm very, very particular about who I work with because, you know, our names are going to be on it. And I've been on panels with, you know, best practices and ethics. And I don't do, you know, demos. There's no demo before it's time. But I, I love to talk about it and I love to answer questions. And so anybody watching, if you're interested in getting into tier three automotive, give me a holler. If you want to get into tier one, um, I'll ask you some really tough questions. And if you don't, you know, if, if that stuff doesn't not in your wheelhouse, we don't go there. Um, but tier three is for everybody. Young, old grandpa. I remember the first time my granddaughter drove up to our driveway all by herself. And I through the rude. garage door and out the back of the garage. It cost us yeah. $75,000 to get that house fixed, but she sure enjoyed driving. <laughs> Geico. <laughs> <laughs> it turns into an insurance company. But, there you, go. you know, there's all kinds. You can, you know, anything, anything, and, you know, any character is is there for you. It's just a fu fully understanding how to deliver automotive, and it's the same thing. You know, um, Cadillac CTX only thirty eight four seventy five, F one fifty only twenty eight three ninety five. It's the same. It's the same rhythm, thing. different different character different character you there know? You go. and it becomes a part of your dna and i'll tell you man you lock into two or three dealerships you're set and here's a word of advice if you get an offer from a local dealership and they offer you 150 200 a spot don't sneeze at it because that's per spot and you never do one you do four or five a day yeah. make 600 bucks in, in in an hour and a half you know that's pretty cool and they're going to be and selling gonna... cars every month the cars are going nowhere, guys. You know, yeah. I mean, they're here to stay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it and I'm telling you, I have never gotten an offer or a, even an inquiry about AI when it comes to automotive. It's not going to happen. AI and automotive do not match. You know, so if you do automotive and you do local automotive, um, you know, AI is not going to affect you. Explainer videos, all that stuff, corporate stuff, it may. Um, it's getting better and better That's and it's getting scarier point. and scarier, but automotive is always going to be my, uh, me and my community reaching out to you and your family. You know, uh, it's, you're not going to hear, we've been a member of your community for 45 <laughs> years. That's not going to work. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, you, you remind me of me in that once you start sharing information, you can't you, stop, you but... can't stop. You just want to <laughs> keep giving it out. Oh yeah. And then there's this, and then there's the. But uh, but our time is up, and I'm sure some people will get in touch with you. Uh, Cliff Dave, Zellman thank is... Thank you so much. Oh, man. No, thank you so much, Cliff. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Uh, love you, and I'm, I'm looking forward to us hanging out uh, now that we're winding Are you coming down. to Voice One? Uh, or One Voice or whatever uh, that is I, in Dallas? In the I months? might be coming to that, but there are going to be some things we'll be at together. And yes, with sir, that... We definitely I, will. I will let you go and uh, uh, give Joanne a big hug and kiss. And give Mo a big hug for me. Are you downstairs? I see you're downstairs. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm in my office. I, I'm in my dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about cars. Talking about Oil cars. Oil changes. All right. Go. Have see a ya. great night, Dave. Again, thank you so much. Love you, man. You too. Man. All right. The great Cliff Zellman. Fantastic information. Uh, I knew it was going to be good. I didn't know it was going to be this good. Well, anyway, uh, you can find this and all the other Ask Dave Fenoy's Anything at my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy VoiceOver Training. Interested in uh, private coaching or to find out where I'm going to be teaching uh, or Zooming teaching, uh, DaveFenoy.com. Click on the um, uh, Study VO tab. And with that, thank you for being here and uh, book something, okay? See you next week. <laughs>